is block six, the Great Depression, section five, after the 100 days, with the section beginning with the Wagoner Act. The Great Depression was an excellent time for organized labor, that labor achieved many victories during uh, the Great Depression that had been denied to them uh, in the decades previous. One of the most important is the Wagner Act, uh, known as Labor's Magna Carta. And if you know anything about world history, you should know uh, the Magna Carta was uh, the list of rights uh, given to the English lords against the king uh, in 1215. It, it, it means Great Charter, uh, the Magna Carta. And this is Senator Wagner, the guy behind. He's a senator from New York um, who was behind this Wagner Act. And it is known as Labor's Magna Carta, the Great Charter of the American labor movement. What the, um, what the Wagner Act did, it did two things. First, it, for the first time in American history, positively expressed that unions were legal, unions could form, unions could organize, and unions could act on behalf of workers. Before, it had been kind of implied in some court decisions, it had been done, it had been argued over. This law said unions in the United States of America can be formed, can collective, uh, bargain collectively uh, with their employers, uh, and that no act of Congress or law could deny a worker uh, the right to join a union uh, if he so desired. The next thing that it did was create what's known as the National Labor Relations Board. And this is an executive board. Its members are appointed by the president, affirmed, uh, confirmed by the Senate, and it consists of five people. And people on the NLRB, it's their job to adjudicate and to mediate and to arbitrate um, disputes between capital and labor. And if a company is having a labor dispute long before it ever gets to the possibility of a strike, very often that the two sides will be brought in front of the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, and uh, the NLRB's decisions on such things like this um, are, they're not entirely binding. That what the NLRB says is not law, but it's pretty close to law. You can challenge their findings in court, uh, but the court has shown over the years uh, reluctance to overturn what the NLRB decides. These five people, uh, appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate, are very powerful people in American politics. That they kind of, if a pro-labor um, president is appointing people, or if a pro-business president is appointing people, the NLRB is going to have a different makeup. It's something that, you know, it's a very big power that the president has, the right to appoint people to this National Labor Relations Board, which solves disputes and issues rulings uh, about labor relations in the United States. It's where labor goes to complain against capital. So if you're working for a company and you have uh, a problem with how that company is treating you, you can file a formal complaint with the NLRB and they will look into it uh, to the possible detriment, obviously, of that company that you claim is uh, doing something wrong, whether in terms of legal action, fines, uh, discussions in which the company should change its behavior, etc. It's a very, very powerful board. It is one of the great labor successes of the New Deal, uh, and definitely something that lived and lives long beyond uh, when Roosevelt uh, was no longer on the scene. Another success uh, that labor had concerned unskilled workers. All of our discussion about labor in the United States, pretty much up until this time, has dealt with skilled workers. Workers with a particular skill. They were plumbers, they were electricians, they were carpenters, they were steam fitters, they were pipe fitters. Whatever the skill was. And those workers were the first to unionize because they could not easily be replaced because they had a skill. Unskilled workers. Workers for whom their the only contribution they had was their physical strength, you know, in a factory, on a factory floor, had been very difficult to unionize. That the established unions didn't want them. They said they're a weak link. That if we associate ourselves with a union of unskilled laborers, that just makes us weaker. Because the companies can break them, because they can replace them with anybody. Hell, they can even replace them with black people, the argument went. So unskilled workers, for all of this history of American labor that we've looked at last year in this, excluded 
your unskilled workers. That is until John L. Lewis. John L. Lewis was not a friendly man, as you can probably tell by this picture. He was hard-nosed, pugnacious, he had been a laborer himself, he was not college educated, but he was tough as nails and hard as steel in what he wanted. And what John L. Lewis decided that he would do would be to finally organize the millions of unskilled labor workers in the United States. The AFL, that great union, the union of Samuel Gompers, we knew, did not want to accept unskilled workers. But through the force of John L. Lewis's personality, the AFL finally relented and allowed um, unskilled workers to come in. And then John L. Lewis decided that he was going to unionize the greatest companies in the United States. Companies that hitherto had proven impervious to union organization. They had been too strong, the unions had been too weak. John L. Lewis decided that he was going to unionize the factory floors of General Motors, the greatest car company in the United States, and he was going to unionize the factory floor of U.S. Steel, the biggest steel company in the world. For 40 and 50 years, these companies had avoided unionization of their ranks. They paid their workers enough, they kept the unions weak, but John L. Lewis decided that now was the time to break those companies and make them pay their workers more, establish better systems of wages and prices, and not uh, prices, but wages and hours and conditions and seniority and pensions and all the things that John L. Lewis thought the American worker deserved. What he came up with was a tactic known as the sit-down strike. Beforehand, when workers went on strike, they simply would not come to work. And then factory owners would, if they could, replace them with strike breakers, replace them with other people who would work for less that could keep the thing going. And this was one of the great fears of labor, that if they were on strike, they could be replaced. Well, John L. Lewis said, well, you know what? You're not going to be, it's not going to be possible to replace you because when we're on strike, you're going to go to work, but you're not going to work at work. You're going to simply sit down. You're going to go to your place on the assembly line, and there you are going to sit. This is a sit-down strike. The picture here is at the GM plant in Flint, Michigan, on which John L. Lewis and his organization, the Committee for Industrial Organization, um, the CIO, that's where the AFL got its second name, right? It's the AFL-CIO. It's the American Federation of Labor Committee for Industrial Organization. So for after this time, after John L. Lewis brings his unskilled workers into the AFL, the AFL gets a second name. It's the AFL-CIO uh, after John Lewis's organization. And his tactic was the sit-down strike because you could not bring in strike breakers uh, on a sit-down strike because the original workers would not physically let them work. They were there in the spot. And this tactic in the 1930s broke the leadership of GM and U.S. Steel. And both GM and U.S. Steel finally had to agree to accept the unionization of their factory floors uh, and of their workers, led by John L. Lewis, his Committee for Industrial Organization, with his tactic of the sit-down strike. And this was a great win uh, for U.S. organized labor. It kind of begins the glory two, three decades of the American labor movement, the 30s, 40s, and 50s. It starts to die in the 1960s due to international competition, but that's a story for another block.